So before we get into the new material for this module, let's do a quick review of what we've learned so far in Scheme. So in Scheme, if I enter an atom, for example, 10, or a string, or a symbol, when I run this code, each of these things evaluate to what it is. There's nothing to be done. And I can assign a name to these values using define. So we'll define A to be 1. We'll define B to be 2. And I can also define C to be the result of adding A minus B. Now notice these evaluate, and so I get output in the bottom of my Dr. Racket window. But notice there's no output here because all this is doing is defining something. I'm not evaluating anything. The only thing I evaluate here is this, but that's only in service of getting the value to assign to C. So if I actually want to see these values, I need to do A, B, and C. And now these names are associated with the values here with these defined statements. So when I press 1, you can see that I get the results. Now Scheme is a prefix language. So if I multiply negative 1 by C, I get 1, since C was originally negative 1. If I just say negative C, I get 1, which again is what you would expect. Negative C is negative negative 1. And I can always nest forms inside of other forms, such as this. So if I get negative C, this will be 1. So then when I do this outer negative, it becomes negative 1 again. And you can see I get the original value for C. I can also define functions using a lambda. And so the lambda, I give it the list of parameters I'm going to pass. And then I tell it how I want it to evaluate the function. And so now I have this function. In fact, let me put a new line here just to clear up the input. I'll do opposite of negative 10. And I'll do the opposite of the opposite of C. So I'll do all three of these. And as a reminder, in Dr. Racket, if you want to know where something is defined, you can hover over it. So for example, if I hover over a C here, it refers me to the original definition. Same here, it'll refer me to that original definition. Things that are built into the language, if I hover over them, notice it comes from the scheme language. And if I hover over these atoms, they don't come from anywhere. They're just in the source code. So let me run this. And you can see the opposite of 10 is negative 10. The opposite of negative 10 is 10. The opposite of the opposite of C is just C, which is negative 1. And if I take one more opposite, I get back to 1 again here. And so as a reminder of some of our recursion we did, we'll actually do the tail recursive Fibonacci again. So I'll define fib tail to take one parameter. And it's going to call an accumulator method with the initial parameters x, the number I'm looking for, 0 and 1. In my logic here, you'll notice these are the first two Fibonacci numbers. The way I'm going to work this logic is I'm going to build up the Fibonacci sequence here two at a time and decrement this so that I build up this many Fibonacci numbers. In my accumulator function, I have three parameters. And if x is less than or equal to 2, I'm going to return the sum of f1 and f2. If it's greater than 2, I'm going to make a recursive call. And I'm going to subtract 1 from x. I'm going to move f1 into f2's place because, again, I'm moving further in the sequence. So now what was the Fibonacci of n minus 1 becomes Fibonacci of n minus 2. And then I'm going to add f1 and f2 together to get the new f1. And I'll run this with two examples. And here you see I get the expected results. So next I'll do an example of a con statement. And keep in mind that that's like a switch statement you would see in some other languages. And I'm just going to do some random function here. I'm not going to try to do anything specific. So I'm going to take a parameter. And then I'm going to create a con structure that's going to have a series of conditions. So if x is greater than 11, I'm going to return 10. My next condition is if the remainder of x and 2 
is equal to 0, then I'm going to return 2. If it's an even number, it returns 2. If it's greater than 5, I'll return 5. And then finally, my base case, I can put two, true here. I can also do else. I'm going to return 0 in all the other cases. So I'll call this for several values. And I'll even do in this last case, I'll pass in a symbol. So notice that this function is expecting numerics, but there is a base case. So let's see what happens. Well, notice I do get these first five values, but here, even though there is a valid case that would handle a symbol, that being the default case, if it's true returns zero, notice it's still evaluating each of these conditions. And this greater than expects a numeric value. So what I can do to fix that is I can add a new condition. If it's not a number, then we're going to return the symbol not a number. So now when I run this, I get all the conditions met that I expect, but if it's not a numeric, it'll pass a, if it's not a numeric, it will return the symbol not a number. So as another example, we can define a function called what is it that takes a single parameter and if it's not a number, we'll return a string in this case. And I'm missing a quote here because first I want to have a condition and then the value to evaluate to if that condition is met. Here I'll return a string. So notice here I've returned a symbol, here I've returned a string. Again, it's just my preference as to which one I choose. It depends on what I'm trying to do. So if x is less than zero, we're going to return the symbol negative. If x is equal to zero, we'll return the symbol zero. And if x is greater than zero, we'll return positive. So this should meet all the cases. We could, if we wanted to add one more case, we'll do an else here. And then otherwise we would return unknown. But of course we shouldn't get to that case because once x is a number, it should be either equal to zero or less than or greater than zero. So let's try some test cases. And we'll try it with a positive number. We'll try it with a negative number. And let's try it with a form that actually evaluates to zero. So we'll say times three, three, or minus times three, three, nine, which should evaluate to zero. So let's run this. And then you can see we get the results we expect. Again, why did I make this a, a string and these symbols? It was just, for example, it doesn't matter what I return, but you'll notice you get a nicer output if you do it as a symbol instead of a string because you lose the quotes. So that's why I did it that way. But it doesn't matter. Whatever you have after the, the condition, that's what's going to be returned. And notice, once the first thing matches, that's what gets returned. If I tried to do any of these three things with a non-numeric value, I would get an error. However, since I've already checked to see whether it's a number or not, and if it's not a number, I have a case for it that returns the string not a number, I know that it'll always be a number in these cases. Otherwise, it would have met the previous case. So keep in mind that with a cond, you match the first condition that evaluates to true for the input. And that concludes our quick review of Scheme. So now we'll move on. We'll talk a little bit more about recursion and writing recursive list functions.